All right, friends, you are in for a special conversation because I'm here with my friend, John Steingard. You might recognize this name because he was the lead singer of a band called Hawk Nelson. And about three years ago, on Instagram, did about a 2,000 word plus just writing, or not really manifesto, but description, <laughs> that's definitely the wrong word, description of deconstructing and deconverting your faith. Yeah. Now, you and I have had a bunch of conversations. We've gone running down in San Clemente talking about this. And I really, through this, have just treasured our relationship. You've made me think about things. Me too, yeah. And I've really enjoyed seeing this journey you're on. But we haven't really talked in depth for about a year. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, you told me that some of your thinking shifted and it's yeah, changed. it's kind of always changing. Yeah. And you were about to tell me before and I said, <laughs> I don't want to hear. Surprise me. Sure. So the goal of this is usually I script these conversations out to like maximize time and right, just like right, respect my viewer. But I also want to just model at times just having a conversation and being curious. So I really have two goals. Number one, I just want to catch up hear what's going on in your life, but I'm just curious what you're thinking about issues related to God. How does that sound to you for this conversation? That sounds great. I love that. Awesome. And can I just say before we get started, uh, I I can't remember if I've mentioned this on your, the last time we talked on your podcast or your YouTube channel, but the very first time we had a conversation, Mm. after we got off, it was on Justin Briley's show. That's right. And after we got off that conversation, uh, we weren't recording anymore or anything. You kind of leaned, I mean, we were virtual, but yeah, like yeah. you kind of leaned in and you were like, hey, I know this is really difficult. Like, how are you doing? Mm. How's your family? Mm. Like, how how has that, mm. like, I was, re- that, that left a, a really strong impression on me. So I just, like, right from the get-go, I just kind of wanted to say, like, thank you for that mm. because that, that left an impression whenever I hear someone say, like, oh, a, all apologists care care about is making mm. a point or something like that. Mm. I just like, well, I've had personal experience that says otherwise. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And I went through a very different phase of questioning in my own life where I doubted things, mm-hmm. didn't have a public platform. I was a lot younger. <laughs> but I can remember ways that people responded positively and mm-hmm. ways people responded that were not so helpful. Sure. Oh, and I've gotten plenty of that. T- tell me about that. I'm actually curious. What's helpful and what has not been helpful through this uh, for you? I think there, on many different issues, there, when we're talking about any of any, you know, like uh, any faith issues or deconstruction or philosophy of religion or any of these things, uh, sometimes there's a tendency to want to like stake out a position and defend it really aggressively. Mm. And uh, lots of people on uh, lots of different sides of uh, basically Mm. every issue tend to do that. And then, you know, you throw in online where people can say things and not have to look other people in the eye. Very true. And things can get a little bit, you know, a little bit rude or nasty. Mm -hmm. So I, I try not to engage with people that go there really quickly too too much because life's too short, you know. Oh, man, there are thoughtful people that disagree with me that I can engage with without, you know, siloing myself off entirely. I think that's that's totally fair. No, yeah. I saw a tweet and I know I'm going to butcher the words, but within the past few weeks you had some effect of being in just a good spot in your life yeah. that you hadn't been for a while. Now, I don't know if you meant relationally, spiritually, Probably all of that. Tell me about that. Where yeah, are you? I mean, so I, anyone who's gone through a process, you know, whether we want to call it deconstruction, I know the word is it's yeah. debated, but uh, it's a really uh, earth shaking sort of process and it causes you to sort of rethink a lot of things about mm-hmm. your life. And it actually took me maybe a couple of years to feel like. I had I was sort of on steady ground again. Wow. Um, and wow. you know, like relationally with the people that are in my life that matter to mm. me, and then also just like, how do I go about living uh, living my life? And what choices do I make? I've got kids. What am I teaching my kids? What things do I want to make sure that they know? Um, you know, I want to think about. Do we res- how do we restrict information for my kids? <laughs> and like and maybe I want to do that as little as possible, but like okay. also be age appropriate. How do you do that? Great right? Questions. So there's all of that stuff. Um, and then I think in the last year, 
I've, I've gotten to a place where one of my main focuses was just like, I want, I want to, as best I can with what I know, live a healthy life. I, okay. I, I don't want to be tortured by, <laughs> by like, like this existential dread that sometimes, Nobody does. you yeah. know, and, yeah. and there are, there is a limit to how much you can, how much time and energy you can spend thinking about these really deep issues. Like, why is there something instead of nothing? Yeah. Um, you know, and so I had to focus a little bit on, Hey, like I need to focus on my family. Hmm. I need to focus on what's best for them. The people that are in my life. Um, uh, it got really important to me. I, I just turned 40. So I was mm. like, it was really, I felt, I felt the pressure to make sure that like, Hey, I want to be really healthy. I want to be eating healthy. Mm. I want to be exercising, um, that kind of stuff. And I so gotcha. some, a lot of my attention over the last year has been focused on like just really practical stuff like that. Okay, so it's less that you feel like you've landed and answered some of these questions to your own satisfaction, more you're content living with the questions. I think that's, Is that fair? I think that's part of it, but then in the last few months I've gotten uh, I've I've been able to slow down on work a little bit the last month or two and I've gotten I've had a little bit more uh uh flexible time. Okay. And uh, and our kids are now at, a, at an age where they're they're both in school. Mm. And so we've just like got our life back a little bit, my wife and I. And so we've got a little bit more free time and so I've been like I've been in a, a new a new phase where I'm I'm really interested in sort of philosophy of religion again. Oh, and, okay. Interesting. And, and the the biggest mm. things is just like I'm super interested in in the concept of theism on its own, right? So like, hmm. I think when I, for a lot of people who grew up, in, grew up in Christianity, you know, Christianity isn't a single belief. It's like a collection of beliefs, right? Sure. Like there's, and there's quite a few, and you might not be aware of all the beliefs that you're holding individually. It's sort of this conglomerate of like things that you believe. And I think when I went through this process of deconstruction, part of the reason why I think the word deconstruction is actually like at least somewhat accurate is because it does feel like there's an aspect of like taking those apart yeah. and looking at them individually. And like, there might be some of those, some of those beliefs that I grew up holding, th there's plenty of other Christians that don't hold that view. So mm. like, um, you know, like there's yeah. different views on hell or yep. atonement theory yep. or, you know, exactly what do we mean when we say the Bible is inspired? Uh, you know, the authority of scripture. Like there's there's different ways of looking at all of these things, even within Christianity. So I've, I, I sort of found it helpful to go back to the basics and go like, okay, setting aside Christian uh, ideas or, or, um, or claims or anything like that, just looking at theism from the beginning, like just basic theism, mm. Uh, what are the arguments for and against God? And that space alone is like really interesting. Oh, good. I'm glad you're there. So I want to I come back to this yeah, if okay. we can. It's interesting that one of the things that spur this conversation is my most recent book with a buddy is on helping Christians deconstruct hmm. without losing their faith. That's like the subtitle. Yeah. Now we define deconstruct yeah, how as do you define it? Well, so we kind of define it as shedding away secondary beliefs, mm. which is the D, the breaking down, but construct is building something up. Sure. Now, our book is not written for somebody who says, I don't even know if I want to follow Jesus. I don't know if God exists. It's written for somebody more like me who went through a period sure. of crisis in faith and said, how do I navigate, like you said, secondary issues from primary issues? What does it mean to follow Jesus? It's kind of the book that I wish somebody had given to me when I went right. through a doubting period. We tend to write and think along those kinds mm -hmm. of lines. So I think it's really interesting that you define, deconstruct, and approach it the way that you did and that you made these distinctions between kind of essential and non-essential beliefs. I think, I think so, although I, I think at the time, like, I... It took a while to identify what the components of my faith were, right? Okay. It's like when I started, I mean, when I first wrote that message, one of the metaphors I used was one of a sweater and like pulling on the threads I of a sweater. That. Yep. Um, 
Which is funny because there's these. Uh, do you know who Rhett and Link are? Of course. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't. Yeah. I mm. didn't know. And they, like a couple months before me, came out with like a similar Interesting. thing. And they used the same metaphor. And so a couple people had said to me like, oh, you used the same metaphor as Rhett and Link. And I was like, who? I don't even know who <laughs> so these I guys had, are. I had no idea. Huh. Um, so, but I think that's an apt metaphor because it 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 wasn't like I looked at the whole entirety of my belief system and was like, well, that's all wrong. It started mm. with like, wait, something, something's bothering me with this issue or like with that thing. And then I'd sort of like investigate it and it would lead to other questions. And, it, and then I would investigate those and those would lead to other ones. Mm. And I would, and it just kept going. And I was like, it, it you know, and as I think we've talked about mm. before, like it wasn't something I like went looking for. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, I was really troubled by it, honestly. Yeah, I like I, I was know. like, well, this is disturbing. Mm. Um, and so I, I think in re- I'm looking at it in retrospect of now. And yeah. in retrospect, I realized that a lot of what was going on is pulling apart all these individual ideas that were just sort of this big glob for me. And and. And I'll be the first to say, because like sometimes people come at me with this, like, well, it's just it sounds like you didn't know a lot about theology, uh, you know, when you were a Christian. And I would say, yeah, I agree. Mm. I don't I don't mm. think I think there's a lot I didn't a lot I didn't know. And even when I went through that process of deconstruction and I, you know, you know, I was on your podcast or your your YouTube channel and Justin Briley's and like I did briefly, I did a podcast of my own. That's right. While I was exploring all this stuff. And I think during that whole process, I still hadn't totally recognized how much, like how much further I still had to go mm. uh, and and how so many of the questions that I was asking, like they've been asked for a long time. And there's a really robust um, body of work surrounding ask you know a lot of these questions like the problem of evil or you know why is there something instead of nothing like th- these these questions yeah. have been addressed for a long time they have. I don't think they're solved but uh, sometimes someone will come at me and be like well that's been answered ages ago and you know I well, just think that's a little depends you what you mean by solved or answered or addressed or, right right yeah. I mean addressed I would yes. say yes yeah. for sure um, yeah and so now I feel like I'm going like, okay, it is, I mean, I don't know tons of people that hold this. I'm starting to meet more of them, but people that would call themselves theists, but are not Christians mm. and getting to know people in that position is just interesting to me because yeah. growing up in in, sure. in Christianity, you know, it's like, I didn't really hear the word theism. You okay. know, it's just, it was, it was sort of a, uh, it was a, so, an important component of Christianity. Gotcha. You know? So one of the things I love doing is just comparing and contrasting experiences with anybody in sure, life. Sure, But yeah. both of us grew up, your dad was or still is a pastor, if still I remember is, correctly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My dad's not a pastor, evangelist, but traveled in some certain circles. He traveled with Petra and the Newsboys and we've been to similar concerts. Yeah, yeah. But when I hear you saying just openly, yeah, I didn't know a lot of theology. I didn't. No. Part of me, I think, okay, something's going wrong within the church, that we have somebody who grows up in the church, no matter what their profession is, doesn't know a lot of theology, and then is invited to write a whole bunch of songs that people sing and learn and work into their mind, yeah. throw them on stage. Oh, I know. Without knowing a lot of theology. I'm not criticizing you. You're following the the I was just the loving path life, that man. was laid out. <laughs> I was like like I'm that, in a band. That's this it. is fun. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Right. But so mm-hmm. as I hear your story, I'm like, we're messing up and falling short. I'm curious if you agree with that. I uh, yes, yeah, somewhat. I think it's like a it's so like when you say given a platform or something like that, I don't remember exactly how you just worded it, so I don't want to put words I in your mouth. I don't either. But, but <laughs> it's not like there's a, a platform giver who just like decides who gets to be in a Christian band, right? It's like, it's this sort of living, breathing thing like any like any sort of artistic arena is where like people write music. Sometimes other people really like that music and they, they sort of start listening to it. So I don't think like, I don't think anyone ever like, 
looked at me and decided, you know what? He should be a leader in the church. Like, I don't think that ever so I happened agree with like you, that. And I think that's yeah. part of the problem. Oh, uh, okay. Is that yeah. there's certain values that you say, if somebody can sing, if somebody can entertain, yep. we just give a platform because this is important to us. Yeah. That's more so what I mean. Is yeah, I, I, I think I of you. the larger values we have as a church, theology and who has a platform is not really up there. So that's one piece. So yeah. you, you can weigh in more if you agree or disagree with that, but I'm curious if there's other things looking back at the church now that you're a little bit removed and yeah. you're like, I didn't see that, but that bothers me, whatever it is. Oh, there's definitely things that bother me. <laughs> okay. Um, but I mean, I, I was raised in a very charismatic setting where in retrospect, I think that someone's relationship with God and the quality of their faith hmm. was largely, if, if you were to look at someone and go, oh, they're just like, they're really following after yeah. Jesus. It, it's largely a result of your perception of their emotional connection. Wow. Right? That's interesting. Well, I mean, like you've probably yeah. been in yeah. a, in, a, in sort of settings like that, right? Where if you see someone who seems like very emotionally connected to their faith and very passionate, it's very easy to think, oh man, they're just like, I mean, I remember hearing this term mm. on fire for Jesus, yes. right? <laughs> they're on fire for Jesus. And so I think- Choir the fire, baby. Right. And I, and I, oh man, don't get me started on a choir of the fire. <laughs> I have stories. Uh, but... My dad spoke at a choir of the fire for a few years. Yeah. But, but well, keep going, keep well, going. That's a whole, well, that's a, that's a tangent. <laughs> but um, but I, I, I think every stream- Every faith tradition probably has blind spots That's fair. To, to some degree. Um, and so I think the blind spot that that uh, this sort of very charismatic evangelical stream that I grew up in had was that it really emphasized this emotional connection in your faith, this, emo this very emotional, exper experiential sure. aspect, and probably didn't emphasize enough... Um, thinking about theology or, or uh, Bible teaching or, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not like that stuff wasn't happening, mm. but it, it wasn't the thing that was considered the most important. Cause you hear things like, it's not a, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Oh, I hear that one plenty right? of times. And so, yep. and so I'm not passing judgment on, on that phrase or mm. that approach or whatever. I just think it's, it's probably the blind spot of the stream that I grew up in. You, you know, that it produces people like me. <laughs> well, yeah, I did. I was not implying that was not my point. It doesn't I, only I think, produce people like me. But I, I uh, so I grew up on a crusade. My parents were on crusade staff. Right. So in many ways, there's an emphasis on are you outreaching and yep. winning people for Jesus? Sure. Yeah. That's the mark of a Christian. There's right. probably some rationalistic. If you have the right theology in place, yeah, marks a Christian. There might be some a little bit more of the social gospel. If you are. Yeah. serving the poor a certain fashion, yeah. then that is the mark of a Christian. And I think you're right that all these can have strengths and all these can For have sure. weaknesses, yeah. I think is a fair way to look at it. Now, on your journey, I think you used the word atheist in your original post. Did you? I didn't. Oh, you didn't? No, okay. I know I didn't. Okay. Uh, but I did say, I think the wording was... I am finding that I don't believe in God or something like that. Okay. I have I have always felt weird about the word atheist. Okay. And um I've had you know there's all these conversations about like how do you define atheist? Is it just a lack of belief or is it an active disbelief in God? You know like I I don't find that conversation interesting. I agree. Absolutely. Uh so I tend to I mean I prefer the term agnostic because at least it signals an openness that like, hey, I'm I'm sort okay. of withholding judgment here. Okay. And 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 I'm I'm interested. I'm curious. I mean, I'd rather approach all of this stuff with that posture. Okay. Um but I'm fine not using any term either uh, as well. I mean, I've heard crypto theist, which I think is funny because <laughs> I, I've never heard that. And I it's basically someone who's not actively a theist, but who is curious about approaching things from that perspective. It's not a very useful term if no one knows it. That is more of indicative <laughs> of our culture, needing a term with every possible belief that somebody has. 
Uh, I think it's funny. I don't use that term yeah, either because I, it, it's if no one knows what it is, it's not helpful. I agree. Yeah. So would you, if you had used the term, is agnostic? I would more probably. That's probably the closest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It seems like I remember this. Correct me if I'm wrong. When we were having one of the first jogs shortly yep. after your yep. your announcement, you had said you kind of went through an atheist type. Uh, like not believing in God, but yep. very quickly looked at certain things in the world and just thought the idea that this is all material mm-hmm. is just not attractive to me at all. Do I remember that? Yeah, correctly? no, that's right. That I think I think I uh, I don't think I ever wanted to say this like publicly, but I think to you privately, I said something mm. to the effect of atheism seems boring. Yes, you did. <laughs> I remember. I never quoted you. I was hoping you said that actually. Um, but <laughs> I so wanted to tweet I that. I know. At the time I know. You're like, I, and, and I was like, well, don't quote me on that, um, because it's like. I think what I mean when I say that, um, it, it, you know, I, it could be taken in a way that I don't mean. But I, I, I actually, I, I did get really into philosophy of mind for a while. Okay. And I don't think I can be a physicalist. Okay. So I, I, I tend to hold. Uh, I mean, it's uh, of course it's one of the wackier ones, but I I I tend towards panpsychism. Okay. Or I or I could be convinced oh. of idealism. Okay. Oh, interesting. Uh, basically, I I my intuition tells me that we are not two things like body and soul or body and mind. My intuition okay. tells me that whatever we are, we're one thing, and so that. Okay. That if I take dualism off the table, I could either pri- I could either go physicalism and say, well, yeah, we're one thing, we're just matter, we're just stuff. Yeah. Or I could go the other way, and I could say, well, in some way, mind is fundamental or mm. primary. The way that panpsychism does that is just says everything is conscious. Right. Um, so what seems to be matter has this conscience potentiality in it, in a sense. I'm pretty. I'm fairly at the moment. I'm fairly convinced okay. that the subjective experience that each of us has uh, is is not explainable within physicalism. Hmm. I, I'm I'm pretty convinced of that. Like okay, like like so like the the classic example is uh, philosophical zombies, mm-hmm. right? So like you could imagine a creature like you mm-hmm. or I. You, you know this already, but I'll, I'll re- it, re- reiterate for your audience. The classic example, I think it was Chalmers that suggested this, okay. David Chalmers. And so he, he says, you know, you could imagine uh, a physical creature, the same as you and I, mm-hmm. where all the mechanisms are working exactly as they do, but there's no inner experience. Because the inner experience doesn't seem to be necessary, you know. And so if that's the case... Why do we have an inner experience? Hmm. Um, and if physicalism can't explain the inner experience, then we have we have some work to do. And so he's a he's a property dualist, which is borderline. Yeah. I mean, you could yep. it flirts with panpsychism, mm-hmm. but panpsychism is weird because it's like everything that exists is every. It posits that consciousness is a fundamental aspect of the physical world. In the sense that, like, even an electron has some fundamental bit of consciousness about it. Now, it wouldn't be the same sort of awareness that you and I have, but. Okay, so just for clarification, yeah. you said you, like, when you reflect upon yourself, mm-hmm. you believe it makes more sense, not that there's two parts of us. It makes more sense to me that we are one thing. One thing. Not two. Okay, yeah. so now you know this. Technically, a, a Christian worldview is that we are embodied yes. souls. So yes. we're one thing, but we have a material and an immaterial part of what we are. So I'm agreeing with you. I'm just right. clarifying. Yeah, yeah. Substance what, dualism is the probably the most common view within Christianity. I yeah, would, and there's yeah. nuances from For Plato's sure. approach to Aristotle's approach. But bottom line, we'd yep. be an, an embodied soul. Now, sure. to me, like that just perfectly fits the way I see the world. So for example, yep. when I think about something like pain, mm-hmm. right? There is clearly physical selves that we have and C fiber firings that are taking place. Mm-hmm. We have physical bodies, but pain cannot be reduced down. You can't describe it by a certain weight or color or extension in space. The best explanation is hurtfulness. 
So there's this subjective, almost immaterial, not physical part hmm. of our experience. So I'm not so much making an argument, just saying for me. No, I and see, maybe, I see maybe that's I've, your intuition. Maybe yeah. I've talked myself into this, but it seems like we talk this way all the time. We talk about our bodies as if it's ourselves. Mm -hmm. When someone gets mm -hmm. hit, you know, if I hit you, you'd be like, you hit John. Yep. But there's also a sense where your body changes yeah. and you, your thinking and center of consciousness stays the same over time. So my only point is that yep. really seems to match up with the way we, I, I would argue most people see the world, myself yes. included. What am I missing in terms of how you would say you see the world? So I, I think that the, my objections to that view you know, would be substance dualism. My objections to that are along the lines of, well, there's, there's a couple of them I can think of off the top of my head. One of them is that it's not clear how your, if your mind is immaterial or if your soul, whatever word you want to use, it's not clear how that interacts with your physical body. Okay. Um, and in neuroscience, there's like no real place where like they can see that happening, right? So, so it's not exactly clear how that interaction would occur. And then there's also plenty of of examples um, of someone who has a brain injury, and their mm. brain injury dramatically changes their their personality, mm. dramatically changes who. Who, who they seem to be in some sense, right? And so the classic example is uh, this guy named Phineas Gage. You've probably heard this story. Great example. Yeah, so he, this I, what, railroad worker? I forget the exact profession. I think it was a railroad worker. Sounds... And he got an iron yeah. bar that yeah. just went through his skull. And he lived, but it damaged like a significant portion of his brain. And after that, he was like a different person. Hmm. Where like he he didn't used to be he he became very angry I think he became an alcoholic he he was like not able to control his urges and so it's clear it's the lesson from that for me is that is that it does seem like physical things have the uh, the ability to sort of change who we are in a sense hmm. like physical changes to like damage to our physical hmm. bodies. So, I mean, I, a lot of people use that example to argue for physicalism. Right. I I have other problems as we've as we've said sure. with physicalism because I I don't think it can explain like internal qualia. But now we're now we're doing a podcast okay. about the philosophy of mind. So I don't know. I don't are, know how long we want to stay there. Can I? So I, I I'm torn live <laughs> making a decision. Because I don't want to have a debate about these things. Oh, but no, I also, no, no. I, also know I think you, this stuff is fascinating. I also know you're the kind of person that you can push and pull and think and not are not out to like win points on mm -mm. this. So let me throw a thought on each one of those. Sure. And then you say what you think and we'll move on because I want to get back to your story. Sure. So the first one, you're right. We don't have a mechanism for how mind and matter would interact. Yeah. Now, if there really is mind that's not matter, you mentioned like neuroscience. How exactly would neuroscience detect this anyways? That would be a question that I would ask. I'm not sure that's the right tool to I, identify I, it. I actually, I don't know either. I'm not a neuroscientist. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't think in principle because yeah. they're studying matter that such a thing could be detected. But with that said, I think my thought is I would say, you're right, we don't know how that happens, but there's a whole lot of things we don't know how it happens. Like electrons are, are particles and they're waves. waves at the same time. We yeah. have no idea, yeah. but we see the effects of both. Even though we don't know how, it makes the most sense of the two phenomena. So if I just reflect upon my experience, I know I have a body and I am going to pick up that cup in a minute. Not a minute, you know what I mean, in a moment. Well, how did that happen? I made a decision with my mind. I don't know how my mind translated my body, but it seems mm -hmm. the obvious best explanation is that a mind made that choice and actually did it, even if I don't know how. Uh, I would agree that a mind, a mind did. Uh, although I'm with an asterisk here, I'm sort of agnostic on like determinism versus oh, libertarian okay. free will. Okay, I right. I go back and forth on that one. Okay. so I don't I don't. I have problems with both of those views. So okay. in, in a sense, I find compatibilism. 
appealing, okay. but I don't un- I don't understand how compatibilism works. <laughs> and so okay. uh, when it comes to free will, I'm sort of I don't know. I'm I'm not okay. sure about that one. But I agree with you that you have a mind or you are a mind. But whether that is something that's separate from your physical body or not, I'm, that's where I'm not sure. That's where you're hung up on it. Yeah, or, yeah and that's why that's like the right. But okay, I, I, I've heard I've heard uh, like uh, Josh Rasmussen. Yeah, I've heard yeah. him say. Had him so on. He, yeah, he's fantastic. Brilliant. He's a is a theistic, brilliant um, philosopher, brilliant philosopher, and he, uh, you know, he he said something. It's fun. Twitter's fun because I get to interact with like real philosophers and they actually like answer my questions. I don't know why. Um, That's impressive. But it's it's so fun. Um, and he made this comment to me on Twitter once where he said, it seems like your worldview, he's big on worldview, right? Uh, he, he's like, it seems like everyone's worldview tends to track towards prioritizing matter and thinking that's fundamental or to prioritizing mind and thinking that's Hmm. fundamental. And what he means by that, I think, is that for for a, I mean, just to address the dualism part of that, like, I think that for most Christians, in some sense, if you believe that you have a body and you have a mind or a spirit or a soul, you would in some sense think that that mind or spirit or soul is more fundamental than your body. And in some sense, right? Yeah, I'm with you. So, so, so you, so you would be more on the, on the side of like, probably mind is more fundamental in some sense. Sure. We could put a lot of asterisks, as, asterisks <laughs> on that. Um, but I, I, I have found a lot of the arguments of the sort of primacy of mind to be kind of compelling. Um, mm. And I think Josh Rasmussen is, is someone whose work I've appreciated. Uh, Bernardo Kastrup is an idealist who I think is really interesting. Mm. Uh, Philip Goff is a panpsychist mm. who, who I think is really um doing interesting work. And so I'm really fascinated okay. by that side of the spectrum. Um, You're dropping names on this, man. You're well, Dave, the, David are, Chalmers. Uh, I didn't mean like name dropping. No, I, mean, I don't know. I'm impressed that you're reading Chalmers and Rasmussen and some of the thinkers here. That's that's awesome. That's well, and, and like, you know, for anyone who's out, I, oh, they have one pointed at me. I've been like, <laughs> uh, but for anyone who's like interested in these kinds of topics, like these are, these are, there's, these are great They're people big. to, to, to check out and learn from. I yeah. agree. I think so on, on the second point, the objection you had was Phineas Gage was the name, yep. the nail goes through, changed the personality. I think this could be interpreted through different lenses. Yeah. So a substance dualist perspective would say, well, there's a there's a neuroscientist by the name of John Eccles. And he says, compare the body and the soul, like a piano player and a piano. Mm-hmm. Now, falls short because piano player and piano are both physical. Sure, but sure. But the idea but being I, the piano is like the body mm-hmm. and the soul is like the piano player. So the soul has the capacity, the piano player, to play through the piano. Yeah. But if the piano is damaged, there cannot be the expression of the music in the way it should be played. Right, right. So in a sense, from a substance dualist perspective, your soul has the capacity to see. But if your eyes get damaged, you cannot see. There's parts of the brain that are connected with different parts of our personality Mm -hmm. and our decision making. They get damaged and the rest of the brain can't compensate. We would expect to see personality and decision making changes. Now, that's not an argument for substance dualism, but no, I think no, I, I think it saying. can yep. withstand. It can make sense of logically that objection, if yep. that makes sense. Yeah, and I think also it's open to the substance dualist to say that uh, that correlation is not causation. Like I think 100%. I think that I agree. that response is open to the substance dualist too. So okay. uh, so yeah, it's not like that's the thing. If there were knockdown arguments for any of these things, then we'd well, I was about to say we'd see more agreement. Maybe we wouldn't. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think I think it's you know, we all have our own intuitions about some of these things and and fair enough. Uh, and I, I, more than anything, I just, I think the conversations about it are really interesting. And thinking about consciousness really opened my mind up to be able to consider theism 
again. Mm. Because so I read this book called Other Minds by Peter Godfrey Smith. Okay. And he studied he's a philosopher of mind, but he studied octopuses. <laughs> like for a really long time, cephalopods. Interesting. And octopuses are really intelligent. But their mm. intelligence evolved on a totally separate track to ours. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you look at intelligent animals like, um, like, like intelligent apes and stuff like that, sure. or, or even um, like dolphins, maybe. Yeah, or even something. dolphins. Yeah, yeah, like it's like we're all mammals, right? Yep. And so there's there's a common evolutionary history. Um, I'm assuming uh, evolution here. So it's I'm fine. not going yeah. okay, no, like, no, 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 no. to worry about it. But, uh, but cephalopods, they broke off from our evolutionary history way, way earlier before hmm. any animals were nearly as intelligent as, as we are. And so their, their consciousness, I'm ass assuming they have one, which I think is a good as assumption, their intelligence evolved really differently than ours. Their nervous system is distributed throughout their bodies. They have basically these little mini brains for each arm hmm. and then a central brain that coordinates everything. But that central brain isn't, isn't nearly as significant as ours. Like their nervous systems hmm. are way more distributed. So what would it be like to be a creature where different parts of your body are in some sense thinking for themselves and acting on their own, but, <laughs> but also coordinated? Yeah, yeah. And so that got me thinking about like what it, what it means to be aware. My awareness is one example of what it means to be aware. But awareness could seem really different for other types of conscious creatures. Hmm. So like octopuses, just what it is to be an octopus must be so different than what it is to be a human being, right? Hmm. So that got me thinking about uh, there are different, there are probably many different ways to be a conscious entity. And that made me think, well, maybe if God were real, hmm. maybe the sense in which God is a conscious entity is completely different than the sense that I am, you know, hmm. which I think you know, you would at least absolutely uh, agree with that somewhat, for sure. I think. Yeah, um, for sure. And so I think that opened me up to think like, okay, like maybe I've been thinking in this box where I'm imagining that God, whatever God is, has to be a person in the sense that I'm used to. And and maybe I need to explore outside of that box a little bit. And so that's... I, I love that. I've been asked, like, how can God answer prayers for multiple people at the same time and be aware of so many different things? Sure. And I hadn't thought of the octopus example. I might use that in the future. Sure. Yeah. Note to self, I will try to remember to give you credit, but I'll probably... No, I don't forget. care. I don't. It's not me. But, it's Peter Godfrey but, Smith. Th oh, yeah. th that's a very interesting, helpful way to think outside of the box. Yeah. I, I love that. You know, one interesting thing about octopuses, this is a side note, is the structure of their eye mm -hmm. is very remarkably similar to a human eye. And yet oh, a very different, like you said, evolutionary pathway. Yes. So either people argue there's certain things in nature that push towards a common, yeah. you know, structure to emerge, or there's design that could account for it. Of course, I favor design, but that's just an sure. interesting point about the I, octopus and a human, not even a coordinate like yeah. we are, similar eye structure, fascinating. Now, that that aside, how urgent are these questions for you? Like what motivates you? Is it just that oh, this is- Oh, this is a good question. You're just interested yeah. or there's a sense of like, I've got to figure this out? Uh, so I think there was a sense of urgency like earlier mm. in my process where it really stressed me out, Sean. <laughs> like I was not- well, I was mostly not having a good time. Um, mm. Now I feel like a, a, a huge sense of peace a, about it. Um, I, I feel, I feel like now it's more of an adventure of exploring these things the way that mm. the way that I like to explore the wor the physical world, right? Like I love mm. to travel, mm. so I I think about philosophy in the same way, like. Um, I'm reading Swinburne right now, Richard Swinburne, which is like, Amazing. I feel like so overdue. Amazing. Um, because I, I asked on Twitter a few weeks ago, like, okay, whether you think these arguments succeed or fail, what do you think are the best arguments for theism? And a, a, a lot question. of people 
said Richard Swinburne. Swinburne. And I was like, yeah, I've, I know a little bit about him, but like, I need to actually go and read him. So I'm doing that now. And, um, and, and, you know, right out of the gate, he is, he, uh, he shares a few of my intuitions Hmm. That and not not all of them. Of course, I'm sure. I'm finding ones we're diverging on pretty quickly too. But uh, like, there's certain intuitions that that he shares. Um, like, I I don't know, I don't know how to make sense of a of a of a person who is timeless. Hmm. Uh, because it seems to me that any hmm. sort of choices or actions or experiences require time, Are time bound, and or some kind of time. You know, like I, I think William Lane Craig posits mm-hmm. a meta, like a meta time of some yeah. kind or yeah. metaphysical time, I think he calls yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and so so that to me is some kind of time. You know, it doesn't have to be time as we experience it. But it, it seems it seems to me like I don't know how to make sense of the sort of classical theistic view that God is timeless and immutable. Mm. Like to me, I don't know how uh, that kind of a being could be a person in any way that we'd recognize. Hmm. Um, but I still think it's a live option. Like maybe, maybe, you know, be, I'm bouncing all over the place here. Do I apologize. No, but like it. one of the more compelling theistic arguments that as far as I can see is like arguments from contingency. Mm. And so I like the Leibnizian. Leibnizian. Yeah. I, yeah. I always Leibnizian. feel like I'm going to say his name wrong. Fine. I like his formulation of it where he talks about explanation Things that, ha- you know, contingent things have an explanation for their existence. Mm. That chain of explanation either has to end somewhere mm-hmm. or goes on forever, which has problems, yep. or runs in a circle, which has even more problems. And so it's like the most attractive view is that that chain of explanation has to end somewhere. And that ending is some sort of necessary. Necessary being, that's right. He says necessary being, I know in technically being doesn't mean a person in this case, but like in colloquial terms, being usually does. Oh, I think in, oh, I'd have to go back and confirm this, but I think Leibniz would say it has to be a person and a being, not just being itself. I think in stage I two, could... he goes there, right? The sta- like there's two stages to his argument from contingency. Okay. I think the first one just establishes, he does argue for a necessary being- but I think, and I kind of, I get this wording from Rasmussen because he says foundation a lot. And I like yeah. that word yeah. because, yeah. because it's like you can, the, the, the atheist or the agnostic, agnostic could agree on a necessary foundation, right? Like without, you could say there's some sort of, that chain of explanation ends. Okay. And then there's some sort of necessary foundation to reality. And then you could go on to talk about like, well, is that foundation something that could be called a being in any, like a, a, a person or, a, you know, anything like that. But I, I do think that stage one of the, uh, of Leibniz's, Leibniz? Yeah, Leibniz, Leibniz, Leibniz. 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 Yeah. Uh, I'm never going to say that with any confidence. Uh, I do think stage one is pretty compelling. Hmm. It's I think it's more attractive to 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 accept the view, or at least tentatively accept the view that there has to be some sort of necessary foundation to reality. Interesting. And so then, what is that going. foundation? So when you, so at this stage, you you think that foundation could be physical. Or do you think that foundation, even if it's not a mind that's a personal mind, right. would be immaterial? Are both candidates in your mind or are you leaning towards mind? So this is where this is where the question gets really interesting because – so a philosopher like Graham Oppie, like mm-hmm. a famous atheist mm-hmm. philosopher, he would say that whatever explanation the theist – Whatever range of explanations that, that are open to the theist to explain the existence of God, those same explanations are open to the naturalist to explain the existence of the universe or whatever exists, right? And on, on principle, I think that's right. Like, I think, mm. I think that's correct. But there is a question about, like, what seems more likely to produce something? Hmm. Uh, a mind or um, or some sort of foundation that's fundamentally mindless. Hmm. Um, 
And, you know, I'm still exploring that one. But again, going back to consciousness, my curiosity sort of goes toward like, well, it seems like mind would maybe make more sense there. Mm. So that's where like I would sort of score a point for theism, right? Mm. And go like, well, uh, you know, how do you make sense of a fundamentally mindless foundation generating anything, mm. you know? Uh, but then, of course, you know, the, the, the in general, an atheistic response to that would be that it's possible that nothing is impossible. <laughs> like in the sense that like... It's not logically possible. It's not. Nothing impossible. Well, they might say that... They, a better way, way to say it would probably be they might, they might say that it's possible that nothing existing is not possible. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah do you yeah, know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm saying, I'm trying yeah, to figure that, out the best fair. way to say that. They, they might say okay. that there might be some, it might be necessary, it, whatever that foundation is, we're calling it necessary. And, okay. the, and what we mean by that is that it could not have failed to exist. Right. Or or in possible worlds talk, you could say like it, it exists in all possible worlds or something like that. Okay, so you said that's one check for theism. You've gone back and you're looking at philosophy of religion. So I imagine you've looked at the moral arguments, maybe looking yeah. at information, fine tuning. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other ones that give you pause, pause or give you further checks in that category? And then I want to come to those you would give Bach X's to rather than a check. Sure. Um, I think arguments for design... The problem with arguments for design is you very quickly run into fields where it requires a lot of knowledge hmm. to to make really coherent, to take really like coherent positions. Um, so like our mutual friend, Dr. Uh, Jonathan McClatchy, right? Yeah. He's a molecular biologist. Yep. And so he is a firm proponent of yeah. arguments from design. Yep. Whenever I'm having a conversation with him, I'm like... Sometimes some of the stuff he says, I'm like, I don't think I agree with that, but I don't exactly know how to argue with you yeah. about this okay. because you're so much more knowledgeable than I am about these topics that that I, I struggle to sort of know what to say. So that, that, with arguments fair. for design, I, I think they, they hold a lot of intuitive weight, right? Agreed. Um, but, but I also think that like, I also think that uh, evolution by natural selection is pretty compelling. Hmm. And I think that common descent is extremely compelling. And so I look at the fact that evolution, the process of evolution has managed to take us from single celled organisms. Now, given we don't really understand how, of course, what's the word abiogenesis. Yeah. Uh, we don't really understand. Abiogenesis. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, there we go. That, of course, a biogenesis. That makes way more sense. <laughs> uh, we don't really know how that occurred, but from that point on, the idea of evolution by natural selection getting us to where we are today seems to make sense to me. There, I think there's questions about some of the process sure. that I think are legitimate, but. I look so, so at me, that. So me, okay, keep going. Well, no, no I'll just finish that. Yeah, yeah. I look at that and I go, okay, I see a naturalistic process who that can that can definitely make things look designed in some mm. sense. And so I wonder if if there's other processes mm. like that because I, I do think that that process is fairly compelling and I, I think it's true. And that's interesting. So I, I look at that and I go, are there other areas? Where design, where there appears to be design, where if we just learn more, um, we'll find that actually there's a natural process going on. You know there. who made that argument was Dawkins in the God Delusion. I know, I know about fine. I'm trying not I'm to not, reference well, him. My point was not it's wrong because he did, but he said we know in biology this is so definitive, so this can explain fine tuning. This yes. can explain, and he pointed I, that to other well, arguments. I, well, he doesn't. I don't think he actually explains fine tuning. He I, he waves it away. To I agree with you. Yeah, I think you're and right I'm about very that. resistant to any explanations that feel hand wavy. I on think that's, both and I, I, I on have, both sides. That's fair. I have I have I have qualms on both sides with that. So okay. So design yeah. so design arguments. Most of them would concede some kind of biological evolution. Most. So yeah. Swinburne, by the way, wrote a book called "The Evolution of the Soul," and I think he oh, believes I don't know this one. in a kind of evolutionary account. I haven't read it since grad school. Yeah. Early two thousands. 
but he would be okay with some kind of evolutionary account. Yeah. That, in some ways, design would say, you know, something from nothing point to the Big Bang. Obviously, evolution is independent of that. Point towards fine tuning, origin of life. Yep. Uh, All our questions. privileged planet. Mm -hmm. For life to evolve, you can't even have life unless you have a universe. I'm right. sorry, you can't even have an evolutionary process yes. unless all these things are yes. first in place. Biological evolution so really, presupposes all of those things. In some things. ways, I would yeah. say, even if evolution were true, mm -hmm. and that's a separate conversation, sure. that only gets somebody really this far totally unexplained. You, so you agree with that? Yeah, totally okay. agree. Interesting. I, I, I think... Uh, when 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 we're talking about the fine the apparent fine tuning of our universe, I think there are some interesting responses to fine tuning arguments. Um, I have a friend who wrote a like a philosophy thesis about, <laughs> and I I'm gonna butcher it, and I feel so bad. Uh, he he made the argument that from the Christian point of view, if you as a Christian believe that. Uh, you already believe in non-physical life if you believe in angels and demons and stuff like that. So okay. his argument is that like the the universe doesn't need to be fine-tuned in any way for life to exist. It can exist. It can exist in any number of different ways. Mm. Um, so that's 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 a quirky response. I don't know why I brought that one up first because that's the weirdest one. But uh, I mean, I'm sh I'm, I'm sure you're too too fine-tuning. Right. Right. Yeah. So and I think I I mean I think the response would be that you can't have life of any kind, even basic chemistry and physics, if there are not these laws that are set within the parameters that they are. Well, do you think angels are alive? Uh, I do think angels are alive. So They're... that is life. Okay. So I mean life in our physical universe. Sure. sure. Yeah. Angels are spirits, of course. So you're sure. right. They're not bound by Laws sure. of physics. That's a that's yeah. a that's a fair point. Um, but yes, I, there are there are some responses to like there's the many worlds interpretation that all you know that of course yeah like yeah. multiverse type yeah. stuff which I don't I don't know I, I there do you so it, let me I don't ask know you, how compelling you that is to you, me. You've looked at all these arguments yeah. and I love that you're going deep and reading all these folks and reading Swinburne. It, I because I asked myself this question. Sometimes I ask myself, am I overanalyzing certain things and not just seeing certain intuitions and truths that are there? Because you seem to have sure. certain intuitions that there's objective beauty in the world, arguably, or is that not an intuition that you I've have? I've thought a little bit about objective beauty, but not as much about, or not about as much that as I have about morality. I've thought about morality a lot. Okay, so let me, let me come back to morality. Yeah. But the point being, it seems like you have certain intuitions yep. that lean more theistically than the opposite direction. Some, Is yeah. It some, so really yeah. like 60, 40, 70, or it's hard oh, to I just quantify. I don't know. Uh, but a lot of my intuitions that maybe lean theist, uh, I have a whole other set of objections once we come to Christianity. Like mm. a way larger set, <laughs> so mm. and so, I, I sort of I sort of have questions about. I tend to think that it is possible that there is something mm. like God that okay. exists, but that it's very, but that that whatever that is is so different from what we're used to thinking about as far as like. Theism, mm. you know, because the the theisms that we're used to encountering are various forms sure. of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Judaism. and then yeah. there's polytheism, which I actually think yep. gets overlooked. Um, yep. uh, shout out to my polytheist friends, <laughs> uh, but uh, so I, I I sometimes wonder if we've thought about God in in these um, terms that we've inherited by uh, from the traditions that 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 exist already in the world mm. um, whether we're raising them or, or convert into them and so i wonder if there's options now sometimes some of these lines are drawn for good reason right um i think swinburne actually makes a pretty good argument for a personal god mm. um but i i also you know uh philip goff who i mentioned mm -hmm. earlier mm -hmm. he 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 um he defends panpsychism, 
he sort of holds this view of a limited God. He doesn't consider himself, uh, he doesn't consider himself a Christian, I don't think, or even a theist exactly. But I think he would agree that there's, you know, the thing he always says is that like, because he does think that the that uh, fine tuning arguments hold weight. Okay. But he also thinks that the problem of evil is a really big problem. Mm. And so he says, what what can account for both of these? Right. And so he, he, his view is that a limited God or a sort of impersonal God Got it. Um, could could account okay. for both of those things. And, and interesting. I think that's an interesting position to so, stake so out. Let me, yeah. let me shift gears. How many sure. friends from when you were a public Christian? <laughs> are still your friends now. You don't, not, yeah. you don't have to throw anybody under the bus. You don't have to name one in particular. But talk about now, because it's basically been three years, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't think I lost as many friends as I could have. Okay. I, I think I've been thinking about that a lot. Like, like hmm. uh, most of my closest friends are all still my closest friends. Um, hmm. And I, I would say the majority of them are Christian. Um, but I I realized that I think I had already surrounded myself with people who, even if they were Christian, they, they were the kinds of people that would be open-minded and supportive of, of someone going on the kind of journey that I, uh, that I went on. Um, you know, so, I mean, I have conversations mm. and again, I don't want to name people cause I don't want yeah, no, no, to out, I'm, out their positions, but I had multiple people. Um, when I wrote that Instagram post, I had multiple well-known musicians <laughs> that I'm friends with call me and say like, Hey, are you okay? I'm actually not worried wow. because I'm a universalist. Uh, there's a, in Christian music, there's a lot more people that hold to universalism than than is known, I think, because I actually don't feel like they feel like they can say it hmm. because it'll be viewed as like a, a heterodox view. Now, by that, universalism, Christianity is true, but all will be saved through, yes, through yes. Jesus. So the, yeah, they in still some they fashion. still believe in not pluralism, in, but universalism. Not, not like uh, not Christian. In, what inclusivism is that the word yeah yeah like yeah, yeah. uh so universalism in the sense that okay. they believed all will they believe all will be saved that that in the end um god saves all um there's different ways to interpret that sure but yeah, there definitely is uh but i had multiple people say like hey i'm mm. not like worried about your soul or anything because i think i think god is in control and i think I'm not like worried about you going to hell or anything, but like, are you, are you okay right now? Like I care about you here and now. That's pretty cool. They um, reached out to you and yeah, have yeah. shown care that way. And, and I realized that the people that I was already friends with, like, I think I was already unlikely to be close to people who were the more aggressive Bible thumper type. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was probably just already not vibing with those folks. And so, so most of the people that, that I was close to, I mean, have, 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 are still my friends and we're, we're still close. I mean, I think with some relationships, there's a, over time, a feeling of distance has grown a little bit, Mm -hmm. which is sad, but also natural. Um, we might have less in common. Um, like I don't go to church. I, I don't, you know, every once in a while when I have gone to church over the last couple of years, it's been a really wild experience. Uh, Cause I'm just like, Oh, right. There's like so many things I forgot about. I'm like, Oh yeah, this is a thing. Um, Interesting. But I also think um, I, I don't, I, I think I have friends for whom their, their faith is an important part of their lives in a way that I can make sense of. Mm. And I can go like, hey, that is that's a valuable thing in your life, partially because of community, partially because of ritual. I don't literally believe that some of that stuff is true, but I'm watching the effect that it has in your life and 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 I would I wouldn't want to like push you to Extinguish remove that, that from maybe. your life. Mm especially knowing what the last three years has looked like for me. <laughs> mm. And so mm. 
I'm a little softer on some of that stuff where I go like, I think my favorite way of wording it, it this is a Michael Gunger quote. Mm. He said, yeah, I don't want to yuck someone else's yum. Hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. And so I'm a little bit yeah. taking that approach when it comes to religious views these days. Like, obviously, I think there's a time and a place to call out things that I think are harmful. And I think on both, um, not both, but like on in many directions, people sometimes will do that. And I think sometimes that's called for. But when possible, I want to I want to encourage people, uh, the people that are in my life, I want to encourage them and support them to to live the way that they feel like they want to live. Hmm. Um, and for a lot of the friends that I have, that means, that means some sort of Christian practice and community. And Okay, so I promise the apologist in me will not even try to respond, but I'm curious what, what you would say are the top objections to Christianity. I know sure. early on it was a problem of evil and the hiddenness of God. Yeah, I think just, those just are still... Just list some of the top ones that would be hangups for you that if you some kind of theistic worldview doesn't incline you towards Christianity. Sure, sure. Okay, so I'll, t- I'll try to not be long here. It, it, Just give me the top few. Okay. Yeah, you don't have so to give I, all of them. I still but... think problem of evil is a problem. Okay. Uh, I, I think that the... I do think it's possible that some amount of discomfort is necessary for a good life. Like, I wonder, like, I, I like the pleasure machine that... that right, right. Like, the most people, if they could choose between having their brain hooked up to a pleasure machine that they right. just had pleasure all the time or living some sort of real life, would choose the real life. It's so called that, the Matrix, take the red yeah, pill, baby. Yeah. So there's, <laughs> so I do think there's, there's, there is okay. some level of discomfort, like overcoming challenges. Sure. Um, you know, like the whole working out in the gym metaphor. Like yeah, I actually yeah, think I that it. holds some weight. I do also think there is some suffering in our reality that is that I, I just cannot look at it and not say that it's gratuitous. Gratuitous evil. Yeah. Okay. And so to me, like, okay. to me, I just think there's absolutely gratuitous evil mm. in the world. And that is surprising on the hypothesis of an omni God, right? Got it. So Fair I enough. would use the, the, okay. the, I would use that phrasing. It's surprising. It's not like you can't explain it. That's fair. But I, so I, so I think problem, problem of evil, evil is one. Okay. I do think divine hiddenness is another. Okay. Uh, you Which know, is kind of the flip side of. Yeah. It's like if God, evil. if God is real and okay. is personal and wants a relationship with me and I'm open to it, which I do feel like mm. I am. Uh, I wonder why God remains so hidden. Um, mm. So okay. the problem of non-resistant non-believers, I think, as Schellenberger puts it. Mm. So I think that's a real a real problem. Again, it's not like I know you. I know that like you and other you know Christian theologians and philosophers have have. Uh, ways of addressing these things, sure. but these are still yeah, ones that, that that's all I'm yeah. asking for is what your so those are mm-hmm. those are a few, and then I think a a, a lot a, I have a lot of questions about the Bible. Okay, um, okay. I I know we agree disagree on this point, but I I think it, it's just so apparent that there's inconsistencies and 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 problems, and and it comes back to for me. Everything that we learn about God in the Bible, we learn because somebody wrote it down, right? Okay. And and how do I say this without just without just like throwing anyone under the bus? I I have learned from experience to to be very cautious about people who speak for God. Hmm. In in our day and age, if mm-hmm. someone says God told me this. I agree with that. I, I've learned from experience that those people are often not trustworthy. <laughs> and, okay. And so, and so That's I wonder why pushing that back a couple thousand years would make mm. them more trustworthy. Okay. Right. And I know, I know yeah. there, I know there are ways of addressing that objection yep. too, but, um, but th- so that's one for me where it's like, yeah, that's all I don't, I, I don't know anything about God. Okay. Uh, out, I don't know anything about the Christian God except mm. from what I've learned from other people mm. because I've never experienced some sort of special re- revelation from God. I would think most Christians wouldn't claim to have, you know, sure. to have like special yeah. revelation. God yeah. revealed his nature to me, uh, you know, personally. Um, so, 
you know, so that's an objection. I also think geography is an interesting objection. Hmm. So for now, this only matters if you believe in some sort of eternal punishment. So if you believe that if you believe that believing in Jesus or not believing in Jesus has eternal consequences, okay. then there's a problem with the fact that, I mean, I think there's a problem <laughs> with the fact that if you are born into a certain country, mm. you are less likely to be a Christian and believe in Jesus. Got it. And so it seems to me that there's something weird there where like you can't control what country you're born into. So say if you're born into a Muslim country, yeah. you're statistically much more likely to be Muslim than Christian. And and I, I, I get that you could make the argument that like, well, they may have the opportunity to encounter the story of Jesus at some point. But I just think the forces of culture are so strong mm. that like it, it seems unfair to me that if there's a Muslim okay. born in a Muslim country or if there's someone born sure. in a Muslim country sure. and if they choose th- that path because it's the path that everyone around them is choosing, that they would be condemned to some sort of eternal punishment. That seems the problem of the unevangelized. Is sure, sure, problem. yeah. Like that seems like a problem. Okay. So evil, hiddenness, questions about the Bible, unevangelized. Sounds like these are similar to the same objections in some ways you stated in your Instagram post. Yeah, but more sophisticated in some ways. I think ways. I've I think I've thought a lot more about them. I think one of the biggest areas where my views have changed is morality. Okay. I think that when I sort of departed Christianity, I sort of bought into the knee-jerk reaction that if God's not real, that morality is not objective. Mm. Because I think a lot of people, I mean, I, I, I sort of had, I don't think I consciously had this view, but I guess I subconsciously had the view that morality is rooted in God's commands or nature or something like that okay. some version of divine command yeah, yeah, theory yeah. but it's not like i knew what that was okay. right uh and so without that it's like oh well morality is subjective okay. um and th- i found that like that had some pretty troubling conclusions okay uh, so you believe in objective moral values and duties i do God. i do so okay. but it took a while to get okay. me there interesting um very interesting so so i i I would consider myself a moral okay. realist. I think moral I think moral truths are objective. Okay, so last question. I yep. know you've thought about this. Uh, what would it take for you to say, you know what? I am a Christian. And is your answer in any way biased from your charismatic background? <sighs> what a good question. Expecting some charismatic thing. Yeah. What do you think? Well, there'd be some pretty big hurdles. Okay. Um, but I, I have thought about that. I have mm. wondered, okay, so is there a part of me that's resistant to Christianity because for 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 not non rational for non rational yeah, reasons? Yeah. For, am yep. I emotionally resistant? And I think I have to concede that like I'm probably part of me is. Um like I think it would be a bit dishonest to think that like there's nothing like oh no I'd be totally fine. Sure. So so I, I'm sure there's some truth to that, but I I try to mitigate it as much as I can and 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 That's all you can do and and go like okay like I have this intuition mm. that Christianity is not true. I should probe that intuition and I should be willing to amend it. And and honestly, part mm. of the part of the way that I do that. And I, cause I've thought about this. I've thought about if I were to be a Christian again, what's the version of Christianity or the stream of Christianity that I would find the most tolerable? Like in the state that I'm at right now, like, Mm -hmm. and there are things about Catholicism that I think are really, Mm -hmm. really interesting. And, um, I, I like, they sort of deal with some of my beefs on scripture by like not holding to sola scriptura. Now, mm. I think the succession of the Pope and, and the leadership of the Catholic, I think that has its own problems. <laughs> and I have gripes with that too. But um, I don't know. I, I think I've tried to mitigate my emotional resistance by cultivating uh, – views on different streams of Christianity that I might find more appealing. So like um, I have a friend who's uh, who's 
one of the leaders in the Episcopalian church oh, in San okay. Diego. Okay. And uh, he's awesome. And they do all kinds of great work uh, mm. in their community. They're LGBTQ plus affirming, which I feel mm. like is important, really important to me. Um, and so there are streams of Christianity now, like I don't, we don't need to get into the progressive Christian versus, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. versus, you know, debate. Sure. I think there are versions of Christianity that exist that I could, that I could get on board with. I just wouldn't be where I came from. For you sure. know, what's interesting is my co-author, John Marriott has written guy, five books on either deconversion or deconstruction. So yeah. about six, seven years. Yeah interviews and study this and he said when people leave and they come back mm. it's almost always to a within different stream. a different stream yeah. that doesn't surprise of me. christianity makes total sense yeah. for so many reasons yeah john literally i could ask you questions <laughs> until we fainted or fell asleep or something like that i can't tell you how much i appreciate how seriously you think about these questions your willingness to let me just kind of push and pull no and please i love ideas, it uh, your openness on this Really enjoy it. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. We need to do this again sooner rather than <laughs> sure. later. That's for sure. Sure. Thanks for having uh, me. It's such it's a blast to talk about this mm. this kind of stuff. And um and I, you know, I don't always get the the chance to do it in person. So it's well fun. you're a nerd like me. I enjoy it too. Yeah. More so with people who disagree with me than people who agree with me often. <laughs> so especially yeah. who well, are Well, usually if you're talking but... you drill things down enough, you can find a disagreement with almost anybody. That's so. true. <laughs> and you can certainly find agreement with yep. almost everybody too. And something which, to learn. Which you do as well. So Hey, those of you watching, make sure you have subscribed. This is brought to you by Biola Apologetics. We'd love to have you come study with me, not only defending the faith, but even just learning how to just engage people thoughtfully, as hopefully we did today, how to have conversations with people who see the world differently. So make sure you subscribe and think about joining me at Biola. We'd love to have you in class in our master's program. John, let's do it again, buddy. Yeah, thanks, man.